Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Yes, my friend, that is what we do. Sometimes the Bible can be a bit confusing, so we bust it down. We're asking questions. Questions like, what do these Gospels have to do with me? That's what I want to know. How can I take these Gospels? and apply them into my daily living so that I can become a reflection of God's love to this world that doesn't know God and definitely is in deep need of more love, don't you think? How can I take these Gospels and apply them into my daily living so that I can become light in this darkness? I want to be a tool in the hand of God making present His kingdom. Not someday, but today and every day, and that's what this show is all about. So glad you could join us today. Got a good one. What do you say? We quiet our minds. It's so easy to get distracted in all the noise, isn't it? There's a lot of noise in this world. A lot of voices calling you here and calling you there. Meanwhile, there's the quiet voice of God that is trying to lead you into His will. But the thing about this quiet voice is it will not raise itself up to compete with the cacophony of screaming voices of this world. So since it won't raise itself up, we got to dial ourselves in. And one very good way of doing that is His Word, because His Word is alive, and it will speak to us. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to school, my friend. Are you ready to be the student? We are hearing from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When Judas had left them, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and God will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so you also should love one another. This is how all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Wow, what a gospel it is. It's short, but it packs a lot of punch. This is Daddy Living. I'm Father Chapin. You stick around. We'll be right back. We're going to talk about this gospel and a few other things here as we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. It is such a pleasure to be able to come into your home each and every week and share the good news, but it's a bit expensive. So I would ask you to consider grabbing a piece of paper and a pencil, and at the next break, I'm going to share with you some details how you can become a partner with Daily Living, and together we can take the good news to a lost world. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Wow. What does that even mean? Love one another as I have loved you. In a world that lives by sound bites, it's very tempting for us to reduce this line to a bumper sticker theology we can all live with, much like we do with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that we who believe in him may never die but have life eternal. Now, Here's the problem. As profoundly true as both those lines from Scripture are, they both leave us asking the same question, and that question is how? How, how exactly do we love? How exactly do we believe? Well, today I want to try to answer that first question. I give you a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. How exactly do we do that? So, oh no, let's go. We always start with context, right? If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times, we should never consider Scripture in isolation. Just as 
we would never take a book off a bookshelf, turn to the middle of it, read one line, put the book back on the shelf and say, okay, I understand the story. We should never pull one line out of the scripture and try to make sense of it. But of course, this is exactly what we do all the time. I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. What does that mean? That's what he said. Well, what's the context? Where are we? Well, we're in the Gospel of John, and we're in the upper room at the Last Supper. And we're coming quickly to the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus, and, well, he knows it. And unlike the synoptic Gospels, of course, I'm talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who all feature the Last Supper with the bread and the wine and Jesus announcing that this is my body, this is my blood. John's very different. John has the Last Supper discourse, also referred to as the Book of Glory, all starting in the 13th chapter of John. It's a good read. You should consider dusting off your Bible and giving it a try. So as I said, we're coming to the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus, and he knows it. And how does he respond? Well, he gets up from the table, and he starts to wash the feet of his disciples, which, that's stunning. I mean, I think about it. He knows that Judas is about ready to betray him. He knows this. Yet even so, he feeds Judas and washes his feet, which, like I said, is stunning. And, and then, after he's finished and Judas leaves, he turns to his disciples and he says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Which, when you think about the circumstances, is even more incredible. I mean, I want you to try to imagine that you knew, I mean, with certainty, you just knew that you were at the doorstep of your own death. And as you're lying in a hospital bed and you gather all your family and friends around you, what would you be thinking about? What would you want to talk about? I doubt you would want to talk about the weather. I doubt you would want to talk about the stock market in your portfolio. I, I doubt you would want to talk about the game. I doubt it would be one of the 100,000 other silly things that we spend so much time talking about. No. I mean, if you knew with certainty that you were just about ready to die, wouldn't you want to talk about the most important of things? Well, for Jesus, the most important of things is to love one another as he has loved us. Right? Right there. That's it. This is the most important of things. This is the deepest desire Jesus has for us. He wants us to love. And of course, love, that, that's a big word. We throw that word love around quite a bit, but what does it really mean? I love ice cream. I love a good cup of coffee, you know, hold the sugar and definitely no cream. A good cup of coffee doesn't need cream. I love Notre Dame football. I love Jesus. I love you. I mean, love can mean a lot of things, don't you think? kind of hard to put your finger on love but one thing's for sure we're all looking for love that's for sure we're all looking for love because we have a need for love just as we have physical needs and intellectual needs and spiritual needs we all have emotional needs and one of these emotional needs is to love and to be loved. So once again, what exactly is love? Is it just passion? Is it just something that brings us pleasure? I, I don't think so. I think it runs much deeper than that. And to answer that question, let's get back to Jesus in the upper room. He knows his death is upon him. And now he has taken the opportunity 
to show his disciples, which by the way, are you and me, right? He's showing us what the love of God looks like. And to do this, he gets up from the table, takes off his outer garments, wraps a towel around his waist, fills a basin with water, and proceeds to wash the feet of his disciples, which, by the way, is the job of a slave. And in all the writings we have from the ancient world, whether that be Greek or Hebrew or otherwise, there are no examples of anybody ever washing the feet of an inferior, except here. I can only imagine they must have been stunned. You know, I'm reminded of my good friends Jim and Pat Rossi. They live, live up in Colton, West Virginia, and they told me this story. Evidently, our bishop was coming through town, and they invited him over for dinner, and he accepted. And after dinner, the bishop got up, walked into the kitchen, and started doing the dishes. And they were stunned. And rightly so, because you generally don't have a bishop washing your dishes, but he did. Like I said, they were stunned. I, I imagine that must have been how those disciples felt that day. Jesus is washing their feet. Like I said, it's the job of a slave. Was Jesus just being nice? No, absolutely not. He's not just being nice. This is a very deliberate act. In doing so, he is showing his disciples, like I said, that's you and me, what love really is, which, in case you're wondering, is getting outside of your own head and being of service to other people. And then I love this part. <laughs> when it gets to Peter, I love Peter, right? Peter says, are you going to wash my feet? Peter's the best. Jesus looks at Peter and says, what I am doing now you do not understand, but you will later. And Peter says, well, you'll never wash my feet. I can wash my own feet. Can, can you just see the pride here? Can you just see the ego, which stands for easing God out? Can you just see Peter all full of himself? And how does Jesus respond? He says, unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. Why? Because Peter is a human being. And as human beings, we are all dirty and in need of washing. It's called our sin nature. Of course, we don't want to hear that, <laughs> but it's true. I mean, isn't it? I mean, our secret selves know this, but our pride gets in the way. You know, wash my feet. I can wash my own feet. Oh, really? My friends, hear me when I say, you cannot even begin to approach Jesus and what he is offering you until you first come to understand that you have dirty feet. Or worse yet, you're dirty all the way up to your chin, and you are in need of washing. And you know, the thing about being washed, like a broken computer can't fix itself, or a lost coin cannot find itself, you cannot wash yourself. But I know a man this is Daily Living. I'm Father Chafee. You stick around. We'll be right back. And we will continue to talk about this amazing gospel that comes to us here as we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living. If you feel like you're being fed by this ministry, I would ask you to prayerfully consider a partnership with Daily Living and what we're trying to do here. A monthly gift of any amount that you feel comfortable with, and I will send you a monthly newsletter, and if you provide an email address, a script of the show prior to its broadcast. Just write a check to Daily Living, P.O. Box 339, Nitro, West Virginia, 25143. You can also go on the website at mydailyliving.com and give through PayPal, and together we can shine the light of the good news in a whole lot of dark places. What do you say we get back to the show? 
Welcome back to Daily Living. Now, just for the break, we were talking about the fact that all of us have dirty feet and are in need of washing and how we cannot wash ourselves. All we can do is get in touch with who we are. And by the way, we are sinners and repent. Because one cannot be found until one comes to understand that they are in fact lost. Which is not an easy thing to do. Because it requires humility. It requires that we admit that we're not perfect and that we are in need of a bath. But unfortunately, a lot of us don't even notice this. Why? Because we're too busy looking at everybody else's dirty feet. But the fact of the matter is, we all have dirty feet and we're all in need of washing, which is what the cross is all about. Because when Jesus hung on the cross, he cleaned us. He washed us once and for all. And in doing so, he gave us not only a clean slate, but he gave us a clean state, which is quite different. Because a clean slate, much like a blackboard, needs to be erased time and time and time again. Which is why Jewish temple sacrificial worship must be performed time and time again. But when Jesus died on the cross, he did it once and for all, giving us a clean state, which means that we all have an opportunity to have a relationship with God. And while we remain habitual sinners and keep getting our feet dirty, the cross has given us the opportunity to wash ourselves in repentance, confident that we will be forgiven. Why? Because the Father honors what the Son did for us. Not that we in any way deserve it. Not that we in any way earn this. But through the cross, we have been washed white as snow. So I guess the only question left is, how are we going to respond? Do we accept what Jesus is offering us? Or are we like Peter and say, well, not me, Lord, I can wash myself. One of the greatest fallacies of religion is that so many of us buy into this notion that somehow through prayer and holy discipline and doing all the right things, that we can somehow, through our own merits, elevate ourselves to a point where we're good enough and somehow deserving of salvation, a merit-based theology. In other words, we all got a little Peter in us. But that is not true. We can refuse to accept the help we need to get clean, but where does that leave us? You know, a couple weeks back, we were talking all about Jesus and Peter on the beach. Remember breakfast on the beach? And Peter was looking at this huge catch of fish, and Jesus looked to Peter and said, Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? Remember that? We should be asking ourselves that same question. What do we love more than the gift that Jesus is offering us? What do we love more than the one who washes us? What do we love more than he who hung on the cross for us? And if we say we do love Jesus, how do we love him? Well, Jesus tells us. If therefore the master and teacher has washed your feet, you ought to wash other feet. What does that mean? I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. What does that mean? How do I do this? We serve. Two months to the day before Martin Luther King was assassinated, 
he gave a speech. And in that speech, he said, everyone can be great because everyone can serve. You do not need to have a college degree to serve. You do not have to have your subject and your verb agree to serve. You do not have to know about Plato or Aristotle to serve. You do not need to know about Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You do not have to know the second law of thermodynamics and physics to serve. No, no, no. All you need is a heart full of grace and a soul regenerated by love. I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. How do we do this? We serve. We serve others. God created you, my friend, for a purpose. And that purpose is to make God's love known in this world in your own unique way. And we do this through service to other people. God has created you with a unique skill set and talents to fulfill a unique purpose. Nobody else can do your purpose. Only you can fulfill your purpose. Meanwhile, our world is selling you a lie. Our world is telling you to just do what you love to do. Figure out what makes you happy. Figure out what you really want and then just get as much of that as you can and then you'll be a success in life. My friend, that is a lie. God created you for a purpose. And the closer you align yourself with that purpose, the happier you will be. So you might be asking yourself, how, how do I, I'd like to know, how, how do I find God's purpose in my life? Well, we find it when we open ourselves up to his will. And, we, and when we do, God's not going to show us the whole thing at one time. No, no, no. You know what God's going to show you? The next right thing to do. That's what God's going to show you. And when is God going to show us this? When we make ourselves available. God does not use the most talented people. No, no, no. God does not use the best looking people. God does not use the smartest people. God uses the most available people. How available are you to God's will today? Do you want to be a success in the eyes of God. If you do, what do we need to do? How can we be a success in the eyes of God? Well, fortunately, God sent his only son to show us we love one another as he has loved us. And how do we do this? Well, the first thing we need to do is recognize the fact that in and of ourselves, we can't do it. Oh, I can't love other people like Jesus loved me. Why? Because I'm a weak sinner with dirty feet. That's why. But God so loved this world that he sent his only son. Why? So that he can wash me so clean that through his Holy Spirit, Jesus can live through me. I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. I can't do that. No way. But he can. And you know what? I'm going to let them. Love one another as I have loved you. And how did, he, how did Jesus love us? He gave his very life for us on the cross. Robert Coleman wrote a book. He called it Written in Blood. And in that book, he tells a story a little boy named Johnny who had a sister who was very sick and in need of a blood transfusion. And the doctor explained to Johnny that he was the perfect donor. So the doctor asked this little boy, would you be willing to give some of your blood to Mary? And the boy hesitated, got all nervous, started looking at his feet. After a while, through a trembling smile, he said, yeah, 
for my sister I'll do it. Soon a nurse came into the room to draw the blood. And as the little boy watched that blood flow through the tube, he looked up at the doctor and he asked, Doctor, how long till I die? <laughs> it was only then that the doctor realized that Johnny had thought that giving his blood to his sister meant that he was going to give up his own life. But he did it. In that moment, he made the decision. Why? Because he loved his sister more than he loved his own life. What about you? What about me? Do we love Jesus like that? My friends, fortunately, Johnny did not have to die to save his sister. But the truth of the matter is, we all are suffering from a disease much more serious and much more fatal than that of Johnny's sister. It's called our sin nature. And every one of us has it. And it has required that Jesus not just give his blood, but his life. And because of the cross, we are washed clean. And what does he ask of us? I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? Because the best vitamin for a Christian is B1. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. As Mother Teresa said, just a little pencil in the hand of a writing God sending a love letter to this world. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life. And I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.